pulled out his knife, ready to plunge it into Ogon's. Ogon threw his blanket up, took the knife, and slit the evil chief's throat from ear to ear. And he fell right there on that spot where we were the next day. Now, you may think that Ogans was a violent man, but he really wasn't. Ogans was a peace-loving man, but he lived in violent times. In fact, he had been raised by the missionaries up in Canada and had come down to bring Christianity to his tribe over across the bay. Well, that was, that was my introduction to, to good Chief Ogans. Chief Ogans was a peace-loving man. So much so that he was asked to be present at the signing of the Treaty of the War of 1812. But he was first and foremost an Indian, and he lived by the Indian traditions and customs, and two of those determined his life and his death. The first says that if one chief kills another, he must raise that man's sons unto manhood. So Ogans took the little boy Jim and raised him to a brave. But then he knew that the other tradition must be served, which says that a son must always avenge his father's death. And so it was one night many years later, again Ogans heard the footsteps coming. This time he simply pulled his blanket over his head and waited. And the tomahawk fell. Well, we were doing good here on the frontier. The crops were growing, and, and, and the livestock were flourishing and multiplying, and the children were growing, and, and it looked like we'd found the right spot to be. Well, what happened, though, as usual when times are really good, dark clouds seem always to rise. And this time, the dark clouds were up to the north. Mother England and, and the United States were back at each other's throats over the Canadian border. And we knew if we went to war, he, we on the frontier were going to be in great trouble because the British would send Indian friends down here on the war path against us. We didn't know what to do, so they decided that I should go to Cleveland and find out if, if, if our country could help us in any way. Fear and danger were everywhere here on the peninsula. It was August and the year was 1812. There was illness. There was something called miasma that many of the settlers had contracted, and some of them had already died. But just about the time it seems that their problems couldn't become any worse, there was a, a cry came back from the lakefront that a boat had been spotted coming across from Fort Detroit, and it was filled with British soldiers. Well, Elizabeth called the two hired men to her. She told them to take blankets, wrap up the three children, go down, take the fastest canoes, get across the bay, over to the far side, perhaps as far as the Huron River, to safety. And then, then she went back to help the other settlers start burying pots, but another cry came that the boat had landed and the men were pouring ashore, so they had no choice but to, to run to the bay, take the remaining canoes. Getting to the Huron River, they discovered another storm. The river was swollen over its banks. There was nowhere to go hot, steamy night, but to hide behind trees, not knowing if the shape next to them was another settler or an Indian or, worse yet, a British soldier. When I returned from Cleveland, I knew something was the matter the minute I entered the clearing. I saw the, saw the cabin, but there was no smoke coming from the chimney. It was morning. It was time for to prepare the morning meal. Something was wrong. When I got to the door, it was ajar, and I looked in, and surely enough, food and things, pans, pots, were all over. But there was, they were from the night before. Where was my family? What had happened to them? I'd go over to Benasia, or Paphroditus's cabin, and see, see if they were there, see if they knew what had happened to them. When I got there, it was the same thing. Then I realized they must have went across the bay. They must have been frightened by something. So I went across, and surely enough, I found them there in the woods, huddled together, cold, wet, afraid that an Indian was going to jump out of them at any time, or that the British were on their way. I was able to ally their fears and tell them that the British were not coming right then. We, the people they had seen on the boats were the American troops who had given up and surrendered Fort Detroit. The British had no way of keeping them, so they'd given them old British uniforms, put them on the boat, and sent them back to Cleveland. And that's what the folks here on the peninsula saw. I said we had time to go back to our homes, but we had to go to Cleveland because the war had broken out. So we went back to our homes, we buried some of our things, hid some of our other things best we could, put our most valuables on our pack animals, and left our homes. Went down here to the sandy point. We forded the animals across, 
some of our farm animals, got over to the sandy point over on the other side where there was a lush meadow. And we thought that the animals might be able to survive there while we went to Cleveland to wait out the war of 1812. Pa, pa. What is it? What is it, Henry? Can I tell the story about Guy in the Tree? Oh, this is a good story. It's about the first skirmish that ever happened in the, in the War of 1812, and it happened right here in this peninsula, just down the road a piece. Henry's good at this story. Well, the soldiers went to one of the three orchards to get supplies, and they told one of the soldiers, his name was Guy, to stand watch by one of the trees. And so Guy went over to the tree, and he had his gun, and he was keeping watch. And he didn't see anyone around, and he was getting a little bit tired. So he stuck his gun in the ground, and he climbed up into the tree to take a nap. And a settler walked by, and he said, he yelled up to him, I'm not sure it's a good idea for you to have your gun in the ground while you're in the tree. And Guy shouted back down, it's all right, I can get my gun before anyone else can. The settler said, all right and he went and he got in his boat. He was just a few strokes away when he heard a gunshot. And he turned around and he saw a guy fall out of the tree. And as the story goes, Guy was shot by an Indian with his own gun. <laughs> so, whenever I'm out hunting and I want to climb up into a tree to take a nap, my pa tells me I should always carry my gun up with me so no one can shoot me out of the tree with my own gun. <laughs> That's our boy, Rachel. <laughs> well, the war dragged on for many, many months. But finally it was over, thanks in large part to the efforts of a young naval officer named Oliver Hazard Perry. The war had taken its toll on the peninsula, and most especially on Phanasia and his family. His good friend Epaphroditus Bull had contracted the miasma and died. His wife Polly said, I will never go back to that wilderness again, and she went home to Connecticut. But worse yet for Benasia, Elizabeth also contracted my asthma and died. It was left behind when the settlers set out the next spring to come back here. The sight they saw as their canoes came ashore across the bay were it was beyond anything they could have ever dreamed. All of their cabins, all of their homes had been burned. All of them except one. Many believed that Elizabeth's cabin was spared because that little boy she fed the Johnny Cakes was now a brave, and he had chosen to pass over her cottage. So, Malaysia set about to once again make a home for his three children, now a young widower, and of course the children didn't want to be here. There wasn't much excitement after the city of Cleveland, but, but he did have one thing to take solace in. That, that fiddle. <laughs> well, he began playing that fiddle, and the more he played that fiddle, the farther the news spread about how good he was. There were people like the widow, Peck. Oh, oh. Ladies, this is the kind of woman who prepares roast black swan for Thanksgiving mm -hmm. Well, the widow, Peck, of course, invited him and his fiddle to come and play, and he went. But better yet, one day, a uniformed writer arrived from Cleveland. Would Mr. Benasia Wolcott care to come and play his fiddle for the first Fourth of July celebration ever held in Cleveland? Well, Benasia thought that he would like to do that. And little swine. Ma, Ma, and, yes, can I tell a story? All right, you tell. You just tell Pa. Selina said, Pa, Pa, can I go to the ball with you? Oh, I, 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 I don't know. Oh, no, I don't you know. Please. Oh, oh, all right. I, go get your things together and we'll go. So Selena went and got her dress. She showed, she sewed some little pretty bows on it to make it look pretty. Not much fancier than mine is though right now. Then they hopped on their horses. And then they went to the sandy point. And then when they got there, they had to hop in their boats and, and because the water was too high for the horses. When they got to shore, they saw Indian trails, 76 miles all the way to Cleveland. When they got to the ball, Papa played his fiddle all night long while Selena danced all night long. Then the next morning, Selena stuffed her dress in her saddlebags, and then they went 76 miles back through the trails and all the way back home. And do you know what Selena said? She said, I'm glad we didn't have to wear hoop skirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
It was it was ten long years here on, on the peninsula with raising the children by myself. Uh, they were good children, but it was hard times. We had good crops, but we couldn't get them to market. When we couldn't get them to market, we didn't have money. And you know, we needed money. We had taxes just like you folks do today. We had to buy some necessities and things that we had to have, so we didn't know quite what we were going to do. But then, three good things happened. First good thing happened was, I heard that there was going to be a, a pension given to those who had served their country in the Revolutionary War. Well, you know, I served my country in the Revolutionary War, so I thought, but Asia, why don't you write a letter? So I did. I took out pad and quill, and I wrote, uh, Dear Congress, I, Venetia Walcott, living here on the peninsula and having served my country well in the Revolutionary War, now find myself on hard times, and, 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 and as I am in failing health, I am wondering if you couldn't, couldn't consider me one of those pensions to help me through my daughter each. Then I signed it, Benazia Walcott, I posted to that and shipped that off to Washington. Well, that was the first good, start of the first good thing. The second good thing, shipping started picking up. They were coming out, they were calling things from here, back east, on the lake. And, 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 and so you could get some money for your crops and all. And when, when we, when we, when they are going to have shipping, you know, they're going to have something else down here in this stony point so the ships don't go ashore, and it's called a lighthouse. Well, you know, folks, if there's a lighthouse, there's surely going to have to be a lighthouse keeper, and who better than but Asia Walcott, who has served his country well in the Revolutionary War. And you know what those lighthouse positions paid? $350 a year, if you can imagine that kind of money. Well, anyway, that was the second good thing. The plans were underway for that. The third good thing was my fiddling. Just like Rachel said, I love to fiddle, and I'd go to every gathering all over, put right spot all through those 10 years, just fiddling away, making people happy, having good times at all the gatherings. And finally, we went over to Huron, playing there, and uh, I looked out across the way, and, and oh my, 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 there, there was a woman with red hair. Oh, goodness sakes, I thought, I've got to meet that woman. And so I thought, when she gets over to that refreshment table, I'm going to lay my fiddle down, and, and I'll, I'll take a rest like I usually do. So sure enough, she got over to that, that refreshment table, and I laid my fiddle down, and I got over there, and I had a little cup of cup of something to give me a little courage, you know how that goes, and, 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 and I finally got the courage, and, and, and you know, I entered, found out who she was, she was Rachel Miller, school teacher from Pura, and oh, goodness sakes, it was nice talking to her, I enjoyed her, and I think she enjoyed me too, because every time that there was a gathering that Rachel was going to be at, you could bet I'd be there with my fiddle, just a fiddle away, waiting for the refreshment table, and, and, and so we got to know each other quite well, we become real good friends. And finally, I got up some courage, and I, uh, Rachel, uh, you know, we, we've known each other for some time now, and, I, and, and, and uh, you know, it, you, you, you're, you're a, a, a fine friend, and I wonder, have you ever seen the peninsula where I live? Uh, have you ever no, seen my farm? No. Oh, I'd love for you to come and see my farm. It's really a thing oh, to see, that it? peninsula's a place of beauty. Oh, Would you come over and visit with me? Oh, well, I, would li I would like to very would much, oh, Mr. Yeah. Walcott, but, but... No, no, no. That, that wouldn't be proper. Oh, not by myself. Oh, yeah. Like, like, well, yes, yes. I, I know what you mean. You know, you know. I, I have some good friends that are coming over Sunday on a boat uh, from over by Ogon's place. Uh, would you like to come over with them? Could you do that? Would that be all proper? Oh, I think that would be just fine. Would you want? Yes, I'd like that. You're going to come? Yes. Sunday? Yes. Oh, my goodness. We just come on Sunday. I was so excited. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know what to do. I did the chores. I run it around. And then I do this. And I, I pick some trees. Oh, my goodness. Six Rachel's going to come and see me. And, and finally, oh, I didn't think that week would ever pass. And it surely did. Oh. And I woke up on a Sunday morning. And I looked out over the bay. That day happened to be a real bright sunny day. And I watched for that boat from over on the other side. And I watched and watched, and finally here it come, you know, and I just couldn't hardly stand it until I waited and see. And sure enough, there in that sunlight was that red hair. And I knew Rachel's on board. She is coming to see me. I'm going to see her. And so surely enough, the boat pulled ashore, and I helped her out. Oh! <laughs> and you know, she came ashore right underneath that big old sycamore tree that I, I had come ashore on when I first came here. And I told her all about a button being Venetia's button sycamore. And, 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 
And then I, and I told her all about the survey party that I'd come on. Well, then, you know, I was showing her all the different things, the lush surroundings here, the great big old oak trees. They're so big around that you couldn't get your arms around them. And, you know, they had big old grapevines hanging down from them. They were bigger on my heart. This whole, this whole peninsula was just a lush, wonderful place to be. So we walked up. Then I went through the fields, showed her my crops, and into the cabin and showed her all the fine work I'd done there, out back through the pastures and showed her all the livestock and how they were flourishing and growing. We went back through the woods and then out onto the peninsula. There's an open spot in the peninsula where the, where the limestone outcrop comes right up to the surface. And the rich grains, wild grains, grow around the edge of that. We'd fat our animals on that in the wintertime. Well, I showed Rachel all these wonders. And then we come back through the woods. And there was a little clearing there that's, that's one of my favorite spots. So I asked Pastor to come there with me. We, we stopped. Rachel, uh, you know, we, we've known each other for some time now. And goodness sakes, I think the world and all of you. Uh, I, I, I'd like for, for it to be much more than just the friends that we've been. But I don't know quite how to say this. You know, I, I'm a man in my 60s, and, and you're a woman. You're a woman in your 30s, and, and, and I, I don't. Well, Rachel, I, I'd like to ask you to be to be my wife. <laughs> yeah, now, if you would, yeah, now, now if you would, I, I, there's some things I want to tell you. I found out I've got a pension coming from the government for my services in the Revolutionary War, and they are going to build that lighthouse down there in the point. And my good friend William Kelly, who's the builder, tells me that he's going to that I have a good chance that I'm going to be the lighthouse keeper. And you know what that pays? $350 a year. And, and, and with all that, I promise you if you, if, you, if, you, if you become my wife, I'll build you the grandest home you've ever seen. It'll be, it'll be a stone home, just like they have back out in Connecticut. Federal style with, with fireplaces at each end and, and two doors. Window door, window door, window door, and, and it, 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 you'd be the envy of all the women of the Western Reserve if, if you'd consent to be to be my wife. Mr. Wolcott, I, I would love to live in a home like that. But I would marry you anyway. You're a good man, and I know how much you love this place. You would, I do too. You would marry me? Yes, I would. Oh, yes, oh I will. Rachel, Rachel. Yes. Oh, 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 well, Rachel, I, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, you know, you you think this, this is all honey and cream out here. Oh, it's no. a hard land. No, it's it's hard there's a lot of hard work. we got to get the crops in. Sturdy one. Yeah, and we got yes, the horse and, and, and on the plow, and somebody's got to drive that I can do. I can do that. And yes. if that horse yes. goes down, yes. we'll put you in the traces. <laughs> <laughs> and so began our life together. Ten wonderful years and two beautiful children. A son named Henry and a daughter named Elizabeth, after the first Elizabeth. Well, I was named Lighthouse Keeper, and had a lot of work to do down there, but Rachel was right there by my side. We'd, uh, we'd carry that whale oil up there all day long and just carry and work, 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 get it up there. And then finally we'd polish the prism so that light would shine out, speaking of safety over the lake. And then it was back down the, the long steps and, and uh, there was a rope, ropes hanging from those lights. And, and there were rocks in that. And we'd take the rocks and twist them in the ropes and twist and twist until those ropes got twisted up tight. And then we lit the light, and just as the sun was going down, we let the ropes go, and they'd start unwinding, and that light would then shine its beacon of safety all out over the lake to tell the boats to sail off that rocky shore. And then we were finally done for the day. We trotted back here to the farm. We're about we were about a mile and a half from, from the lighthouse over across the way. And we come back thinking that the day was done, but all that work was over with. And we got home, and you know what we found? Those young people hadn't done their chores. There was all kinds of work left to do, and it was back more work, 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 oh, work, work, work. Heaven's sakes, what nation you make it sound like all we did was work? Well, it seems to me like there was an awful lot of work. <laughs> there was also an awful lot of fiddling going on. <laughs> <laughs> Many's a summer night you'd hear them coming across the bay, the splash of the oars, and here would come the canoes filled with young people, the, the young men paddling for all they were worth, and the, the young ladies in their prettiest party dresses with a picnic 
picnic lunch sitting in their lap. They'd get to the shoreline and then, oh, here, 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 show. The young men would pull the canoes ashore and then they'd present their backsides and the young ladies would hop aboard and they'd carry them right up here to our lawn and spread out the picnic baskets and, you know, this was so the girls didn't get their party shoes, but of course. Well, they'd spread out all this food and we would eat our fill and then we'd clear away the food and then out would come that fill. And when Benesia woke, I played that fiddle. Nobody sat still. Everybody was up dancing until the stars began to fade. Don't you know, invariably, one of those young ladies would say, What time must it be? What will Ma say? Mm -hmm. And just as surely, one of the young men would say, But look at that wind out there. Oh. We can't possibly go on with wind like this. <laughs> Asia would say. Rachel, Rachel, look at that bay. There's no way these young people can go out that bay tonight. Pass. We might as well clear a place for them. <laughs> Ever helpful, Benasia would clear out the threshing room floor and they'd all bed down for the night. Not to worry, they were good young people. The next morning, they'd be up at dawn, they'd have breakfast with us, help us with the chores, and then it would be back off across that bay, home to Ma. Benasia was not only popular with the young people, he was also quite well known with their parents. Well, this place was growing. We had neighbors now. It was a regular community, and it was a good life. Children were growing like weeds, and, and Rachel and I had a fine life together. But as usual, when things are going too well, dark clouds gathered, and this time they were clouds of sickness. Cholera epidemic was hitting this whole area, but especially over in Sandusky, very hard. In those days, if you got the cholera, you were going to die. There was no cure for it. So when the person would get the cholera, they'd put them on board the boat, and they called it a cholera boat. When they got a boatload, they, they took it out in the lake. And as the poor souls passed away, they dropped them overboard. Well, being down at the lighthouse, tending to it, I couldn't help but watch as some of them washed ashore. And I stood it as long as I could, seeing them lay there. And I finally went to Rachel and, Rachel, I just can't stand to see those poor souls laying there in the stones and the rocks. And I just got to give them a Christian burial. Benesha gave them a Christian burial. But he gave them more than that. He gave them his life. Because by burying the bodies, he too contracted cholera and died, as did his older son, William. Both of them are buried just up the lane out here, in a little family cemetery. The government, in its infinite wisdom, saw fit to give me a small pension to raise the two younger children, and in something unprecedented for the times, they named me the lighthouse keeper, the first woman on the Great Lakes. It was two years later when I remarried, my new husband was immediately named the lighthouse keeper. <laughs> Benesia Wolcott was a good man. He and that fiddle of his brought a great deal of joy to this peninsula. His descendants, his and Elizabeth's and ours, still live here. And that lighthouse beacon has not stopped shining since the first night Benesia lighted it, 176 years ago. People like you still come to our front lawn to hear stories and be friends. We hope you'll come back, perhaps next spring when, when Benesha's apple trees begin to bloom. Travel safely to your homes. Godspeed. stories for five years now and the house has come a long way since then thanks to the help of a lot of a lot of contributions by a lot of people and uh, we would certainly like to have your contributions today too but <laughs> they're they're just to tell you a few things uh, the, the skirmish that Henry told you about there is right across the down the road about a quarter of a mile on, on the uh, bay side uh, a park 
uh, where there's a, a, a monument to that first skirmish and the men that had fallen there. Uh, so if, if you'd like to visit that. Then we have the cemetery down back at the end of the uh, uh, road here. Uh, and you, you can ask anyone, they'll give you directions on how to go back. It's quite a place if you go back. And the uh, the Fires Corporation gave that to a, the Danbury Township as a historic park to go with this house. Uh, so that's that's one of the one of the things that's happened. Uh, since the house was purchased by the, the Ottawa County Historical Society in, in uh, 1989, because it was the oldest house in, in Ottawa County and had such a rich history, which I hope you've heard today, and that's what we tried to tell about. Uh, we have put on a new wood shingle roof. Uh, with the help of the Custers International, we received a, a uh, grant to build this this fireplace, to restore this fireplace that had been taken out at one, at one point in time. And it was built when you took the wall off that was in here, you could see the lines of where the old fireplace had been, the old firebox and all, and so it was built to uh, replicate that. And this whole wall was starting to fall, and the fireplace uh, started from down in the root cellar and gave support to, to uh, solidify the, the wall, the west wall of the home. And uh, so th those are uh, some of the things that happened. Just this year, up, up until this year, you would have had cobwebs and plaster falling on your head throughout this as we got a little exuberant in what we were doing. And this year the walls have been, have been started to be finished off. There's a little more work to do inside. Uh, so. I think you should mention that just last week the Ottawa County Commissioners forgave the remaining $11,000 mortgage on this property, which was a wonderful boom for the future. And, and you know, people can't stay in good times, so right away the the darn fools went back in debt again, you know, and, and, and bought a couple lots over across the way so you'd have parking spaces when you come. And then they're going to give an option on another piece of land over here so that there could be some green space all around. But Rachel, tell them where these stories. Oh, this is this is Miss Josephine, our, our music teacher. <laughs> and our said, you know. I, I'm the best fiddler in the peninsula, but, but I got a little arthritis in the, in the hand, so Miss, Miss Josephine's taken over for me. It's nice for her to, to do so. Uh, Miss Josephine and, and uh, her, her husband uh, were out here, and uh, as before they got married, uh, what was that, a year ago, two years ago? Three years Three. ago. Oh. And we're having fun, time goes by so fast. And, and uh, I'll always remember they come out the day after their, their uh, wedding to have their honeymoon out here with us doing a reenactment. Uh, re so. <laughs> Rachel, tell the folks where the stories come from. Well, all the stories that we've told you are true. They are recorded in books called the Firelands Pioneer Journals, which have been kept every year by the Firelands Historical Society for the last 170 years. They have a meeting once a year where they get together and people tell the stories that have been handed down by their ancestors. Um, Judge Paul Moon, who is a descendant of both Venetia Wolcott and William Kelly, who built the lighthouse, started doing research on this. So all of the stories, right down to the ball gown story, are true. The only thing we don't know for sure is whether or not Rachel had red hair, but it was convenient. We also don't know where Rachel's buried. She just disappeared. Well, tell them about the red hair. Yeah, I'm going to see. She always interrupted me. She never stays in the story. She's talking about anything you're talking about. We found we found a lot of Elizabeth and Venetia descendants, but we only have found well now two Rachel and Venetia descendants. Well, this lady came out and we talked about everything, and I said, well, the only you know, the same thing. The only thing we fudge a little on is the red hair. I said, you didn't didn't have to be any redheads in your family, and she said, my dear, they all have red hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's great fun to do, and um, we're always looking for more stories. At times we have expanded the cast to be 12 characters. Some of the people, like Epaphroditus Bull, would stop in. And, um, Miss the Widow Peck. Oh, uh, what a woman. <laughs> <laughs> no more black swan. That's illegal. But uh, thank you for coming. Yes. I want to answer one question. You may ask any questions, and I'll answer them. But the one question we're always asked is, why is the keeper's house here and the, the lighthouse down on the point? 
And the reason is that this was Benagia's home before he became a lighthouse keeper. It was his farm. He bought 114 acres for $190. Now, would any of you like to make some purchases of land like that today? $190. So, any other any questions anyone has? Is the lighthouse open today to go up? Yes. I believe it is. Yeah. Lighthouse is open. How's the line? <laughs> Very long. Stay here and enjoy here for a while. It's really windy. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you. Questions? Now, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.